Welcome to Natu Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. The Rise of the Chinese People's Communes by Anna Louise Strong, Part 4. Four. Woman and the Family My first hint of what the communes might mean to their woman members came when Rowi Ali returned from a long trip into the least accessible areas of China's northwest. He had been caught in late October by a snowstorm in the Shanxi highlands, and while waiting to have his jeep dug out, had attended a woman's meeting. Quote, there were at least 40 bound-foot women among them, end quote, he told me. Quote, whose lives might have been considered finished, since their bound feet both handicapped them physically and tied them to the past. But they had walked as far as 10 to 14 miles on slushy mountain trails to organize the community dining rooms, nurseries and kindergartens, and old folks' homes. They were, quote, officers, end quote, of the provision department of the, quote, military form, end quote, regular Salvation Army Martinet type laying down the law on teachers, nurses, cooks, and premises, end quote. Till recently, China's older woman seemed almost a, quote, lost generation, end quote. In youth, they had suffered, being sold in marriage and sometimes sold as actual bond slaves. They had submitted to parents and parents-in-law. When their turn came, by right of age, to give orders, the young folk had broken free, defying the right of the old to rule. Now, the commune gave them again an honorable authority to organize the care of the children and the aged on a community scale. For the younger woman, the commune's gift was more substantial. Despite their legal and political equality with men, asserted since liberation, the old patriarchal dictatorship was not broken by one blow. For thousands of years, the old man of the family had ruled his sons and sons' wives and the mother-in-law had ruled the daughters-in-law. The land reform shook the foundation of this rule by giving the woman a share of land equally with the men. The marriage law shook it still further, declaring marriage an equal partnership based on affection and outlawing the purchase of brides. The cooperative farm again shook it when it reckoned woman's work in, quote, work days, end quote. But while the woman's work was thus recognized, the payment at harvest still went, by custom, into the hands of the father-in-law or mother-in-law, and the young wife still had to beg for enough of the money she had earned to buy a spool of thread. So the saying went, quote, Work days for women are nice, like the picture of fruit on the wall. It is pretty, but you can't eat it, end quote. The commune dealt to the patriarchal rule what may well be its final blow. Not only were wages henceforth to be paid monthly and direct into the hands of the worker, but a vast network of community dining rooms, nurseries, kindergartens, quote, liberated, end quote, the woman from household bondage, and gave them a chance, for the first time, to work on a full equality with men. The word, quote, liberate, end quote, will be taken ironically by many American women, who have developed a love for their shiny kitchen and its many conveniences, and refuse to consider their housework as bondage, Though, even in America, it deprives them of taking part in many rewarding community tasks. In rural China's peasant households, the woman's work was close to slavery. Often, though not always, she worked in the fields, and she also ground the grain for the household, cooked the meals on a primitive stove, hauled water from a considerable distance, and then found a husband grumbling because the meal was not yet ready when he wanted it, or parents-in-law grumbling because they wanted their food at different hours. To such women, the commune's gift of direct wages, plus relief from household drudgery, meant a very welcome, quote, liberation, end quote, and they took active part in promoting the communes. Many women told me, quote, With liberation, we received legal and political equality, but only this past year did we attain real equality with the coming of the commune, end quote. In Rocky Mountain Commune and Greater Beijing, the women were active for months before the men got underway. All through the spring and early summer of 1958, 
the woman had been trying to take part in various community drives, for clean streets, for scrap iron collection, for eliminating, quote, the four pests, flies, mosquitoes, rats, and grain-eating sparrows, end quote. In order to have time for such activities, they set up, quote, child-watching stations, end quote, in which four or five households combined, leaving the children in one house under the care of older women, while the younger woman went out on the campaigns. The men were so concerned with the problems of organizing this large commune, which included both farmland, urban areas, and a section of the Western Hills parkland, that they neglected the facilities the woman needed. Finally, the woman attacked by a campaign of Dazabal. These posted statements in which the people expressed their opinions. Quote, You think we aren't needed for socialism, end quote, they asked. Quote, If we are, why don't you help us organize, end quote. As a result of the woman's energy, Rocky Mountain now has an excellent system of nurseries and kindergartens of three types, according to parents' demand. There are full-time kindergartens, where children can be boarded, coming home on weekends, or at the parents' convenience. There are day nurseries, where the children are cared for during the parents' working day, and there are nurseries from which the children go home to lunch and for the midday nap. In Rocky Mountain, the word, quote, nursery, end quote, includes kindergartens, these being here combined into one institution, which is not usually the case. In most communes I have seen, nurseries for children under four are separate from the kindergartens for children between four and seven. Children under four are not taken as, quote, borders, end quote. In early December 1958, a congress of more than 2,000 women met in Beijing, chosen by their counties for some outstanding contribution to the country's life. Their sessions were in a big school auditorium in the southwest part of the city, to which they came by special buses from hotels all over town. Almost all of these women had been illiterate nine years ago, but I was struck by the efficiency with which they now handled a modern-style congress, with elected presidium, committee reports, printed speeches distributed each morning for the addresses of the day. Already, they could not only read, but run public affairs. The hotels were full of them. Every morning, they flooded the corridors of the Beijing Hotel where I was living at the time, on their way to their auto buses lined up at the hotel's court. Often in the afternoon, they flooded the corridors again. Since they were as curious about America as I was about China, I easily collected them into my room, sometimes by individuals, sometimes by small groups. Many were chairmen or vice chairmen of communes, or commanders of production teams in the fields. The feats of others range from scientific research to voluminous production of poems and dramas, or records in driving water buffalo at the plow. The first that came to my room were five women from Gansu, that arid province of the Northwest. All were from people's communes, and each from a different county, but they had traveled in a group to Beijing. Quote, Before liberation, peasant women like us would never have had the chance to see the capital, end quote, they boasted at once. They had been enjoying the sights. The youngest was a girl of 17 named Yue Lanxiang, chosen to come to Beijing for her, quote, work in water conservation, end quote. In the previous winter, the men in her cooperative farm had shirked working on a canal which the farm needed. It was eight kilometers long, and the part through the mountains was, they said, quote, too cold and rocky, end quote. Young Lan, her given name means, quote, orchid, end quote, a popular name in China, had organized a group of three girls with the same name. Quote, the three orchids, end quote, agitated for the canal and went themselves to the hills to dig until they shamed the men into finishing the job. Since Lan was one of the few unmarried delegates, I asked her what she thought the proper age for marriage. She replied that girls were formerly married off at 13 or 14, but now the law says 18, and she thought 20 was better, or even 22. Quote, you should study, and your character should be formed before you take the responsibility of having children, end quote, she declared. The four others in the group, already married, nodded in agreement. I recalled what Dr. Ma Hai Te had told me about the attitude of young people today in China towards marriage. Their courtship is shy, he said, but he lives on a lake where a path makes a popular lover's lane, and he often overhears passing talk. Quote, they walk sedately holding hands, and they talk about her ideology, his ideology, and their mutual steel furnaces, end quote, he said. 
quote, To American youth, they would seem naive. But in things that count, they are less naive than Americans. A girl will make a list of the ten things that matter most in her thinking, and will check the young man on them before she lets her feeling go too far. They are choosing with great care the partner they expect to keep for life. You see almost none of that type of frivolity towards sex that is frequent in America, end quote. The second of the Gansu group, Wang Shahua, was 23 and married. Quote, a feudal marriage, end quote, she said. She had been chosen to come to Beijing for general excellence in farm work, steel making, and in organizing the nursery and the old folks' home. She lived with her husband's parents in the old-fashioned way, but her five-year-old son went to the kindergarten every morning. Quote, Does your mother-in-law approve, end quote, I asked, wondering, since the marriage was, quote, feudal, end quote, if there was a clash over child control. Quote, She likes it fine, end quote, declared Wang. Quote, He was a naughty boy at home, but he is much better since he went to kindergarten. They all line up with a bugle and shut corn, end quote. Young Wang clearly approved of starting them young with useful labor in, quote, the military form, end quote. All these women, quote, just love the military form, end quote. They said that in the former cooperatives, it was very hard to get the field gangs to the fields together on time because of the lack of clocks. Quote, but now a bugle blows at six, and you know it is time to get up. And it blows again for breakfast, and again to go to the field. Everyone comes at once, and the work goes better, end quote. I must add that, no sooner was I convinced of the use of a bugle than I found communes that used dinner bells instead. Some communes marched to the fields with flags. Others used flags only for competitions. Some marched home from the field with a drum and found this, quote, very good, end quote. Others did not. One woman told me that, quote, bugles are most popular, but they are all bought up. There is a waiting list for bugles, end quote. The women were all annoyed at the comments made by Mr. Dulles and other foreigners about communes, quote, destroying the home, end quote. They insisted that, quote, home life is much better now, end quote, since so many sources of friction are removed. They insisted that community dining rooms, nurseries, and kindergartens were conveniences that made home life easier, instead of destroying it. They insisted firmly that they had, quote, freedom, end quote. Wang especially expressed herself on this. Quote, For good field work, there must be discipline, end quote, she said. Quote, We have discipline at work in the day, but all the regulations are agreed in general discussion. When we come home at night, we have freedom, end quote. The great variety of women's achievements in today's China was shown by a group of four who came to my room the following day. Dr. H. C. Ching of Shanghai was a pediatrician who knew some English, and who had made important achievements in research into children's diseases. Her neatly curled hair, prim spectacles, and brown velveteen jacket were a city style that might have come from Europe. Next to her on the divan curled 15-year-old Xie, a mountain girl from Guizhou, dressed colorfully in a figured jacket, bright red hair ribbons, and vivid plaid pants. Her claim to fame was that she could handle six buffaloes at once on six plows. She had finished primary school, quote, just last year, end quote. Formerly, said Xie, girls were not allowed to handle buffaloes. One man drove one buffalo, which drew a heavy wooden plow. Quote, now we have double share metal plows, and girls are allowed to plow, and most girls can handle two or three buffaloes, but I can handle six. That is the county record, but I'm trying next for ten, end quote. Young Xie showed me by motions and diagram how to handle water buffalo. No reins are used. The buffalo plods slowly ahead with a plow attached behind. The driver walks alongside and hits the beast to slap him into place. When Xie handles six buffaloes, they walk one behind the other, and the trick is to keep each far enough behind and just enough to one side so that all the plows will make parallel furrows at the right distance apart. It was a feat as brilliant and worthy of pride as a performance of a professional acrobat. I know briefly Mrs. Jun, a placid woman of 40 who spoke Chinese with difficulty because she was a Zhuang, a minority nationality from Guangxi, head of the woman's section in a large commune of mixed nationalities, and directly handling a working team of 4,000 women who farmed an area two kilometers square. 
Quote, when a plow breaks, I can mend it, end quote, she said. Quote, my own plow, and also the plows of others, end quote. The last in this group was the most restless young person I've met in China. She'd been moving all over my room while the others talked and had absorbed three bound volumes of China reconstructs in 15 minutes, the pictures, not the words, and had then seated herself in a deep chair where she constantly changed position and expression, sometimes smiling like a droll child of six, and sometimes squinting with half-closed eyes like an old shrewd Mandarin, as old as China. When she came to rest, she was a small, compact girl of 18, my most colorful visitor yet, with bright blue trousers, floral blouse, red ribbons on each of two tight braids that stuck straight out to the sides of her head, and edges of different colored blouses and sweaters showing at neck and wrist. When she kicked her legs, which was often, the blue trousers rose, revealing long socks and circular colored bands. Cao was her name. She said she, quote, commanded, end quote, a labor detachment in a commune in Jiangxi, but didn't know its size, quote, because they elected me after I left, and I have been traveling ever since to the county, the province, and Beijing. Just meetings all the time, end quote. Her tone was blasé. When I asked how her battalion managed without her, Cao assured me that there were plenty of good deputy commanders, and she was sent to Beijing, not as a commander, but because she, quote, wrote 14 plays and 400 poems since July, end quote. Her election as detachment commander thus seemed to be a literary honor. Cao began to write in May of 1958. Her cooperative had organized a drama group and found no plays to suit. Quote, it never occurred to us at first that we could write, but after we tried many plays and found nothing we liked, we decided that nobody outside our county could tell our ideas anyway and we must write for ourselves, end quote. So Cao began to write, and produced three short plays between May and July. Quote, then came this idea of, quote, leap forward, end quote, and the county decided to publish my plays. So I hurried up and did 14 more of them, and 400 verses besides, end quote, said Cao. The county had published the plays, and they were being performed everywhere in the county. The books sold outside the county, but Sao had forgotten to ask how many sold. Quote, Get any royalties, end quote, I asked with a smile. Sao kicked both legs so high in glee that the blue trousers rose above the colored socks and showed her bare brown legs. Quote, oh no, end quote, she cried. Quote, I'm not that much of a writer, end quote. To my query whether Sao had a husband, she replied that she had married recently. Quote, just a month before I left, end quote. I asked what her husband did without her, and she said, prosaically, that he worked on the farm. Quote, he's a very quiet person, end quote, she volunteered. Quote, wherever I go, he comes and just sits, end quote. I could well believe it. Cao had enough motion for two. If these are not enough to show that the woman in communes are not, quote, slavishly regimented, end quote, to a single type, I should mention 28-year-old Fan of Anhui, who, against all the advice of the local blacksmiths, made the first ball bearings for the big water wheel in her farming cooperative, and thus started in her area the drive to put ball bearings by local effort into, quote, everything that turns, end quote. And 84-year-old Liu Xiaopo, whose knowledge of cattle is so good that even in advanced age, she, quote, supervises, end quote, a livestock farm on the western plains and came a thousand miles to the Congress in Beijing. I conclude this gallery of women with Chang Qiuxiang of Shenxi, with whom I talked the longest and who told me the most details of commune organization. She is a 49-year-old grandmother, illiterate at the time of liberation, and now the first peasant woman admitted to the Academy of Sciences because of her research into cotton yield. With shining eyes, Mrs. Chang talked three hours about the commune of which she is vice chairman, but suddenly her eyes filled with tears as she said, quote, In the old society, you could see your head in the bowl, end quote. When I did not get her meaning, she explained that in the former days, she could seldom afford to eat whole grain rice or millet, but only gruel, diluted more and more with water as the supply of grain grew less, until there was so much liquid that it reflected your head when you bent over to eat. For Mrs. Chong and the millions of peasants like her, the, quote, free food, end quote, now supplied by the commune, 
good steamed rice or millet, with vegetables and even occasional meat or fish, seems a very good life indeed. What meant to her more than her own improved living standard was the fact that, in all her area, no man, woman, or child need suffer hunger now. Mrs. Chung still works in the fields. Her vice chairmanship of the commune is not a paid office. In daily life, she is an ordinary member of a production team in a village of 63 families. She is pleased that her married daughter, who by Chinese custom now belongs to another family, still lives in the same village and is on the same production team. The mother-daughter closeness, broken by the daughter's marriage, now reappears to cheer Mrs. Chong in the closeness of joint work. Cotton, of course, is the crop which they specialize in, the crop in which Mrs. Chong won fame. Before liberation, she said, 300 caddies per mo, 1,980 pounds per acre, was considered a bumper crop. In those days, the plant grew only two or three feet high. For the past four years, Mrs. Chong's fields have averaged over a thousand caddies per mo. This year, she took special pains, and when she left the farm to come to Beijing Congress, she had already 2,436 caddies per mo, and was still picking. The cotton grows over her head now, from two to three times as high as it used to be. Three groups of Soviet experts visited her field, and one group gave her a badge. Mrs. Chong, however, modestly states that her record is now by no means the highest in China. Some places have better soil and better climate. The highest record, she said, was 8,437 caddies on a small experimental plot in Hebei. Mrs. Chong is known for the fact that she gives all her ideas to her competitors and helps them beat her. When her production team argued against this, she convinced them that the aim of the competition is not to beat others, but to help all China's cotton fields get good crops. This is doubtless another reason why she was admitted to the Academy of Sciences, because she teaches methods well. She has, moreover, a scientific attitude towards her work, keeping records of plots, making experiments, and recording just what methods produce which results. She gave a clear picture of the organization of life in the village of 63 families where she lives. There are 140 able-bodied men and women, and they form one production team with three squads and some 45 members each. Each squad has its own canteen, or community dining room, where one man and three women prepare the meals. Normally, the meals are served in the village, but at harvest, the canteen moves with the working squad to the fields. It suits time and place to the needs of the workers. Quote, the bell rings at six in the morning, end quote, says Mrs. Chang. In her village, they use a bell and not a bugle. Quote, and the workers get up, but the old people and children do not yet get up. They have meals later, end quote. The nursery for small children of three years and under is patronized by only about half of the children in Mrs. Chang's village. The choice, of course, is made by the parents, and usually depends on whether there is a, quote, granny, end quote, in the home. In the homes without, quote, grannies, end quote, the mother normally gets up and goes straight to breakfast and to work, leaving the baby asleep unless she has to nurse him. Quote, the nurse calls and takes the baby to the nursery, end quote, said Mrs. Chang. The kindergarten is different. All children attend between the ages of four and seven. This is because of an unusual arrangement worked out between the kindergarten and the, quote, happy court, end quote, the name given to the old folks' home. Only six people sleep in the, quote, happy court, end quote, in Mrs. Chung's village, but 60 people eat there. The six who sleep there are the old people who have no living relatives to care for them. Old folks who have sons live with their sons' families, but go to the, quote, happy court, end quote, for their meals. Quote, this is because the food for old people is different. It is softer and tastier and not so hearty, and they prefer to eat at different hours. And since the best food is for the old and also for the children, the kindergarten goes for meals to the, quote, happy court, end quote, because their grandparents like to have them there. The whole family, of course, comes home at night, end quote. This cozy arrangement of grandparents mingling with the smaller children is not the usual one in the communes. It probably came from the small size of Mrs. Chong's village and other local conditions, 
I have found a similar arrangement in a few places, but it is more usual for the entire family to patronize the same community dining room, sometimes with a special room in which the old people get their special food. The noonday meal is in most places taken separately. The kindergartens and the old people having their own meals apart from working teams, though even this is not absolute. Breakfast and evening meals vary greatly. In some places, the family eats together. In others, the children get all their meals in the kindergarten and nursery and come home only for the night. Some places combine nurseries and kindergartens in a single premise. In others, they are apart. These community facilities are organized by the mothers according to their desire. Cooking in the home is not entirely ended. Even the new housing plans contain small kitchens and individual apartments. People may choose either to eat in the community dining room or to take their food home and cook it, or to use the community facilities for grinding the grain and then do the cooking at home. Most people prefer the community dining room on working days, but often cook at home on holidays and festivals. Quote, It is a pleasure to cook with the family sometimes, especially on holidays and especially when you do not have to do it every day, end quote, says Mrs. Chong. Like all the women I met from the communes, Mrs. Chong assured me that all these statements made by foreigners about communes, quote, breaking up the home, end quote, are, quote, very silly talk, end quote. On the contrary, quote, the home is much happier now because the heavy burdens are removed, end quote. Formerly, the young wife and poorer families would have to work in the fields and rush home to get the meals on a very slow stove, and then stay up half the night to grind the grain, quote, which must be ground daily if the bread is to be fresh, end quote. Then, perhaps she would be kept awake for the rest of the night by the baby. The husband would grumble if the meal wasn't ready at once when he came from work, and the old people would complain because they wanted their food earlier. Quote, now, all of this grumbling is over, end quote, said Mrs. Chung. Mrs. Chong's statement is doubtless more sweeping than she, as a scientist, should make. Men and women are still human, but that grumbling has greatly diminished is testified on all sides. I talked for an afternoon with Li Baoguang, a secretary of the All-China Federation of Women and herself a mother of six. She was full of tales of women whose marital happiness has been improved by the new facilities in the commune. Some were cases of women who had felt able to marry only because of the help the commune now gave. Others of women whose friction with the, quote, in-laws, end quote, had diminished. Still others of women whose husbands had grown away from them because they were tied to the household chores, but who now gained a new companionship in, quote, studying and going to meetings together, end quote. Young Wang, for example, was a girl leader of a production team in a farming cooperative who fell in love with a young man but was deterred from marriage because he had a family of 15 persons. Chinese families include parents and often brothers and sisters. Young Wang feared that if she tried to cook for 15, her career in production was over. As soon as the commune made plans for community dining rooms, she decided to marry at once. Quote, The commune was your go-between, end quote, teased her friends. There are enough cases of this kind so that one may expect the birth rate to rise as a result of the, quote, free meals, end quote, and this will still further scandalize the commentators in the West. More sympathetic to Western view are cases like Fan and his wife Peng, whose household includes three children and Fan's older father. All use the community dining room, and both husband and wife draw wages. From their first month's wages, they bought a new padded jacket for Grandpa, possibly to assure him that he would benefit from their love, even if he no longer collected their wages. Peng said, quote, Since I don't have to cook anymore, Fan and I go to meetings and study together, end quote. Behind this remark, one feels the yearning of many women, who in the past were unable to keep up with their husbands in knowledge and development, and so lost contact, but who now are free to study as well as to work. Statistics compiled by the All-China Federation of Women for International Women's Day, March 8, 1959, showed a total of 4,750,000 nurseries and kindergartens, and 2,650,000 community dining rooms and communes. This implies an average of 200 nurseries and kindergartens in each of the 26,000 communes, 
and indicates that these are small, intimate institutions, close to homes. Such seems to be the case. A single production team may have several nurseries and kindergartens. Thus, the Xiaoshan production team in a commune in Fujian has five nurseries for its 150 small children, and two kindergartens for 157 older children. These are staffed by 66 people, an average of one adult for every four or five children. 30 of the children are, quote, boarders, end quote. The rest come by the day. They all get regular physical checkups, and it is reported that they, quote, have all formed hygienic habits and are well-mannered, end quote. Singing and dancing are taught, and the older ones are given some elementary knowledge. The teachers in these kindergartens are local women, chosen for their ability to handle children. They are all expected at once to take special study in child care. The provincial educational authorities set up courses, both for women who can come to the provincial capital and for those who must study in their homes. Figures from Anhui and Guizhou provinces show that 70% of all the women, as soon as they, quote, liquidate their illiteracy, end quote, enroll in some kind of study course, usually in connection with their new specialty in the commune, whether this be childcare or cotton raising. The teachers give special attention to the elimination of quarrels and fighting, and the proudest boast of any kindergarten is when they can state that, quote, quarrels disappear, end quote. All women's magazines blossom with tales of how this is accomplished, and of successes which appear minor to all but their participants. In a Hunan kindergarten, when a boy named Xiao accidentally knocked down in a game a girl named Bao, and both got up, while Xiao solicitously dusted off the small victim and play was resumed with smiles, the onlooker would have seen little, but the teachers put down a triumph. They knew that little Bao, when she arrived, had cried on the slightest provocation, while young Xiao had picked quarrels everywhere, struck people, and lied about it. The teachers had given much thought to produce the change in these two small children. Incidents like these are published as examples to be followed, rather than as universal facts, but the general testimony is that kindergartens make the children better behaved. From the standpoint of national construction, and the tasks of the great, quote, leap forward, end quote, the organization of the communes has probably added close to 100 million women to China's available labor force. The change began in autumn of 1958. The All-China Federation of Women claims that most of the autumn harvesting and the plowing and sowing of winter crops was done by the women, the men having gone on irrigation jobs and to local steel smelting fields. In Sputnik Commune of Laoan County in Jiangxi, four-fifths of the 9,700 able-bodied men worked last autumn in irrigation or iron smelting, and the 9,400 women members became the main labor force in farming. They plowed, harrowed, and seeded 34,000 acres of land, after first taking training courses in how to do it. From the extra income thus acquired, they now expect speedily to mechanize their farming, besides having irrigation for all their land. For even while all hands at present work hard, they have already set the 8-hour day as normal, and the 6-hour day as a not-too-distant ideal. Women also start and manage new industries in the communes. In the Leap Forward commune, Taiho County, Anhui, they set up a ball-bearing works, of which 64% of the labor force consisted of women. In a commune in Hangzhou, 12 women set up a cement plant, first sending a representative to a big cement works to learn how. Their plant within a few weeks was employing 103 workers, making 60 tons of cement daily for their own use in building. In Gaolong Commune, in Jiangxi, 11 girls set up a pig farm and found ways to save grain by using fermented wild grasses as fodder, on which the pigs did well. They also learned to inoculate against infections and became amateur veterinarians. To many American women, these jobs will seem not only unrewarding, but unwomanly, even degrading, no road to utopia, but perhaps to the breakdown of health. Chinese women would reply that women have always done the hard, unrewarding jobs of the world, and that now they seek no special privilege, but recognition of the dignity of their labor and equality with men in all the choices of life. As for health, they think they are better protected than when they came as child brides to the rule of their mothers-in-law, or even perhaps than Western women in factories with inspectors paid by a distant, impersonal state. 
The rules to protect women's health are devised by the women's own committees. Three universally accepted rules are these. That women shall work and know what places during menstruation. That expectant mothers shall have light work. And nursing mothers shall have work near their homes. The women in China's communes can point not only to maternity leave on pay, but also to the rapid growth of a system of maternity care such as no country in history has set up in such a short period, if indeed at all. The communes today have 100,000 maternity homes, an average of four to a commune, small places with only a few beds, but near at hand for every home. A typical example is Changyang Commune in Shandong, which has 11, quote, maternity wards, end quote, grouped around one, quote, maternity center, end quote, with a total of 65 beds. The, quote, wards, end quote, each staffed by two or three midwives, are within quick reach of every home. They are planned only for normal deliveries. The, quote, center, end quote, is equipped for simple operations and in close touch with the hospital for difficult cases. All the service is free. Just who invented the legend that the communes in China are moving their members from homes to live in barracks is hard to learn. I have neither seen nor heard of any barracks in any commune that has come to my attention. But every school of architecture in China has been sending out hundreds of its students and teachers into the rural areas to help the communes design new homes to their own desire. There is here space to notice only two examples. The South China Institute of Engineering in Guangdong announced at the end of December that 400 teachers and students from its Department of Architecture had been in the field since October, helping the communes in four counties design buildings. They had written 400 treatises on the subject, because all of the former planning related to cities, and did not take into account the building materials available in the countryside. They had designed buildings for over a million square feet of floor space, and construction had begun on 180,000 square feet. This included hospitals, factories, palaces of culture, old folks' homes, community restaurants, and housing projects. Complete plans had been made for nine communes. More intimate was a news item December 22 from a multinational commune in Qinghai, that high mountain province whose development has just recently begun after thousands of years of lonely desolation. A production team of 60 families were moving to new homes. The planning institute of the provincial capital, Xining, had submitted three designs to the commune. The prospective tenants had discussed them, criticized and modified them, until the final plan was made. The houses were wood and brick, on a brick foundation with tile roofs. There were long, one-story structures in the shape of a big E facing south, with several apartments in each structure. Each family had a separate apartment, depending in size on the size of the family. Thus, the Chiu family, a couple in their early 40s with a marriageable son who might be expecting to add a wife and two younger daughters who might be expected to leave the home, got four rooms, two large and two small, plus a kitchen which does not count as a room. Each group of two or three houses was set in a walled compound, which had space for gardens and for domestic animals, including poultry. A question still debated in communes is whether pigs are domestic animals to be allowed near homes. The tendency grows to keep them further away. Eventually, this may also apply to poultry. What struck me was the cost accounting in the final sentence. Quote, The cost in cash per room is 50 yuan, mainly spent for glass, nails, and varnish, since the commune makes bricks, tiles, lumber, and other materials from raw stuffs on its own ground, end quote. I suggest you read that several times and ponder it, for a hint why outcry arose in the capitalist world against the people's communes. An organization that can build its own brick and tile housing at a cost of $20 per room, plus its own labor, is not dealing only in housing as a home convenience, but is showing an economic potential that challenges the economies of the world. We fear nor heaven, nor earth. For a thousand families have become one family. And though for three years heaven denies us rain, see how our land has water, and golden flowers laughing. Lai Wu, Shandong.